Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 384, the Legal Update Edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Alan Haley, and today is April 12, 2018. i got to finish the taxes. Okay, we have Alan back on the program, and you know, it's good news, bad news when I have Alan on. Uh, or there's no news too that happens frequently <laughs> but uh, sometimes you're here and we're celebrating what happened in Illinois finally the justice you know justice has been served they understand it they they knew how to deal with neutral principles they knew how to deal with the church and they got it right, right. then things like South Carolina happen and you're like oh <laughs> oh why didn't they have her recuse she should have recused right. And uh, now we're on to Texas. Finally, after uh, it seems like decades, we have a decision in Texas. Um, let's tell the audience um, first, how are you doing? Well, in Texas, it's a vote. Uh, it was a panel of three. Uh -huh. one, of the, one of them retired while the case was under consideration. It took so long. It took over two years. And uh, so the re remaining two justices voted to follow neutral principles, quote unquote, but then nevertheless they were going to defer to the Episcopal Church. Okay. So J Bishop Eikers and his group lost. We've done it before, zero. but we really need to do this again. Um, <laughs> neutral principles is a common understanding of the law, and let's explain what neutral principles is. Sure. Neutral principles means simply the principles of law that apply to everyone across the board every day in courts of justice. In other words, no special treatment for anybody or anything just because of who they are or what kind of organization they are. Neutral principles means the same law applies to everyone. And in this case, we're talking about trust law. If you want to create a trust, you have to own the property that you're putting in the trust. You can't say, I'm going to make a trust on my neighbor's property or on that house down the road because I like it. Uh, you can't do that because you have to have the consent of the owner of the property. That's and neutral principles. That's what that says. When you depart from neutral principles into what's called deference, you say, oh, well, there are these certain kinds of churches. They're special. They're hierarchical, quote unquote. And they, unlike everybody else, they get to make trusts on other people's property, even though they don't own it. They can declare, as long as it's a parish in their church, they can say, parish, your property is now in trust for us. And we, the courts, have to defer because they're a church and they're hierarchical. So, and that's the problem. Neutral principles in 1979 was sanctioned by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of Jones v. Wolf. And it, for the first time they said, you know, you don't have to defer to these churches and that kind of, you can, every state is clear to apply neutral principles. And that means giving the same law to those churches as everyone else has to obey. And they, they won't be burdened by it. They can make deeds if they want to. They can make their regulations for pe parishes to come up and sign putting their property in trust. But it's not going to burden them in unduly. And, and unfortunately, the language which the court used to express that, they said it, as long as it's in some legally cognizable form. Well, that's lawyer speak for saying as long as it's as long as it's drawn up like a proper trust deed. <laughs> but you know that's that's just as Blackman for you. I anyway, remember, well, uh, okay, finish up. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. So he put that language in there, and ever since then, the various courts across the country have been misreading it, and and some read it correctly. Some say legally cognizable form. That just means the church gets to do anything it wants as long as it says it's a trust. And uh, we can't interfere with that because Justice Blackman said so. <laughs> and no, he didn't. <laughs> the, the, yeah. Well, the first time I heard about neutral principles and church and stuff like that <clears throat> was back in the early 80s when the Roman Catholic Church was going to have to fight all these lawsuits for sexual misconduct of the priest. And the first thing they did was said, and this is the Roman Catholic Church. This is the Church of Rome. This is all the way over there uh, across the ocean. Said, we're not hierarchical. Uh, don't, even, yeah. don't even assume that. I know we have archbishops and cardinals and, and popes and all that. But no, we're not, we're not hierarchical in the least. Right. And right. we find the opposite here, the Episcopal Church saying, but of course we're hierarchical, yeah. even though... Uh, they have uh, distant uh, reminiscences with uh, the Church of England and, and whatnot. So I, I just find this fascinating what you can do when you get to the court. Well, you, the thing that happened here was, of course, 
Justice Blackman came out with his decision and that crazy language he used. Then we had a, a, a lawyer in at General Convention in 1979, Walter Dennis of New York, who was also a, at that time on his way to being a bishop, I guess. Um, not yet a bishop, though. Anyway, he came up with the idea, why don't we create this canon? It became known as the Dennis Canon. And we'll just take Justice Blackman and his word. We can say in our canon, it's true, it's not in the Constitution. And Justice Blackman said, they can put the provision in their Constitution. Well, we can't do that because it's going to take a three-year process and we'll have to go back to all the dioceses and they'll never agree to something like that. But we can pass a canon that takes effect right in the same year and no one will notice it and we'll just say all property of parishes is in trust for the Episcopal Church. Voila! And then we get we get to take advantage of this special language that uh, Justice Blackman used. And so it was born of a piece. In other words, Justice Blackman, his language, and the Dennis Canon were two uh, spawn of the same devil. <laughs> And that has bedeviled, if you will, the parishes of the Episcopal Church ever since 1979. And they only found out about it, started finding out about it with the first South Carolina case in 2000 after some 20 years. Um, so nobody realized what had been passed until then. And then in the past years since 2000, the courts have made a royal mess of it. Some saying, we'll enforce the Dennis Cannon. Texas saying, no, Dennis Cannon has no force here. And yet here we have the appellate court saying, oh, Dennis Cannon kicks in and uh, Justice and um, Bishop Iker can't hang on to his property. Interesting, of course, the paradox that South Carolina had already decided on neutral principles with the, the Chuck Murphy case and right. said, the church has the, nothing to go in here. Uh, if you own it, you keep it. Right. And they also said, yeah, uh, very clearly in the Waccamaw case, Dennis Cannon has no force in South Carolina to make a trust in South Carolina. The owner has to make the trust. And that we thought was very clear. And then unfortunately, Justice Hearn, Episcopalian member, got up on the Supreme Court and said, oh, let's overrule Wakama. Let's replace it with a better rule that says the Episcopal Church gets its way. And she so divided that panel and so tore everything up with her partisanship that they couldn't even unite on anything. And they went, rendered five separate very splint, splintered opinions. The U Each UPS guys here, if you're wondering. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, but they, they, she so splintered that court, they couldn't agree on anything, and they rendered five separate opinions, which it was impossible to try to piece together, but they, three of them came out with the result that the, uh, that basically the Dennis Cannon could be enforced against the churches that it had agreed to it. So it's, um, you know, we lost there in South Carolina after first having thought we won. Now we're in Texas where we thought we won. And the, you know, the, the opinion, I can say it's just mystifying because what it does is it applies a metaphysical maneuver <clears throat> by which, if you, let me see if you can follow this, you have a corporation mm -hmm. that owns all of the property in the Diocese of uh, Fort Worth. And it's the corporation of the Diocese of Fort Worth. The trustees are appointed by the Diocesan Convention uh, one for staggered five-year terms. The bishop is the head of the corporation. And its sole function is to hold all the property belonging to the various parishes in Fort Worth. Uh, it's not a religious corporation. It doesn't hold services. It doesn't have a church anywhere. It's just a secular corporation. It's like any other corporation with a board of trustees and a board of directors and a president. And in this a court's opinion, <clears throat> uh, the corporation was free to change its bylaws, free to decide who would be its trustees, because the Episcopal Church had no reserved right to say uh, about anything about bylaw changes or the articles or who the trustees were. But because they put in the language saying that the trustees of the corporation shall be members in good standing of the Episcopal Diocese, uh, Fort Worth, as it is now called, that word, as it is now called, that was back when the Episcopal Diocese of Fort Worth was still a member of the Episcopal Church of the United States. And it, that was in 2006 when they amended their bylaws. Then in 2008, the Diocesan Convention, mind you, not the corporation, but the convention of the Diocese of Fort Worth, does a vote to withdraw from the Episcopal Church. I was there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, according to this uh, Chief Justice of the uh, Court of Appeal, that move two years after the fact metaphysically caused the directors 
and trustees to no longer be qualified to sit in their office and metaphysically, after the two years after the fact, gave the Episcopal Church the right to reach in and uh, replace them with their people of its own choosing. Now, if that isn't deference and favoritism toward a particular church, there's no other entity in the land that could even consider such an outlandish, oh, I get to go here and remove these directors. I have nothing to do with this corporation. I can't control it. I can't con do the amendments to it or anything like that. But I get to pull their trustees out and uh, declare them inoperative, and I can put my own in there. And now, look, I control all the property in Fort Worth. Isn't that amazing? Amazing um, in many different ways. Now, we've just depressed people to death about the courts. <laughs> Let's give them hope. Okay. Uh, in South Carolina, they've decided to go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme right. Court, up to this point, for the last uh, dozen or so years, says, listen, we're not going to see it now. We're not going to hear this case now. And just let it sit on, on the docket. Um, you have convinced me that uh, the lower courts and the Supreme Courts of states have screwed this up so much that the justices of the Supreme Court are going to have no choice but to open up the, their binders and, and delve into this. Yeah, I, I hope what the result below in South Carolina with five separate fractured opinions is so egregious, so bad, an example of poor ju ju justice making and judgment uh, decision making, that I hope it will shock the consciences of the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court into saying, oh, we can't let this go on any longer. This has gotten horrendous. They've taken Jones v. Wolf and they've twisted it out of all recognition. We've got to set it straight. So I'm hoping that's what the result will be when they look at the horrific record uh, that's left behind down in South Carolina. And we won't know for another 30 days because the um, there were some parties that said they wanted to come in and file amicus briefs, and so then the Episcopal Church says, well, we'd like to reply not only to the South Carolina's brief, but also to these amicus briefs, so give us another 30 days. So now they don't have to file anything until the end of this month, April. Okay. And then well, You used then a word called, called amicus. Now we're going yes. to do lay speak. <laughs> friend of the court? Right. What, what's amicus? Amicus, it means friend in Latin, so okay. it's a friend of the court. And these are two briefs that came in. There may be others now that I haven't checked, but there was one filed by um, the Anglican American Anglican Council. <coughs> Sorry, American Anglican Council. <coughs> um, you know, Canon Phil Ashey and his group. And uh, there was one filed by 18 law professors who were just so upset at how the jurisprudence of the First Amendment's been torn up by this deference to hierarchical churches crap that they wanted the court, they're saying, come in and set it straight. Let, let's let clean all this up and make it make it good law once again. This is her You can't do anything under this. You can't predict where things are going to come out because the courts are all over the map on it. So it's the job of the Supreme Court to clean up messes that its earlier opinions make. And this is a grand mess. And that's, It, it really is. A, this is better. the wild, wild west where the sheriff <laughs> was brothers with the judge and you know got everything he wanted and it, it, all the prisoners you know right ended up on, on a, the hanging post then we have a mini situation of the same sort in texas where the yeah. texas supreme court clearly said apply neutral principles deference is dead do mm -hmm. not defer to any hierarchical churches and here comes the court of appeals saying oh we've got to defer because fiscal church is hierarchical so the Texas Supreme Court ought to take the same case and say, no, you didn't listen to us. Here's what we mean. You don't defer to special churches. They all get treated the same under Texas law and under Texas law. You don't have the right to come in and replace trustees after the fact. So we can hope that that, you know, that's the common sense view. That's what every man thinks the law is like. And the fact that it's not is perplexing and it's all due to the, the machinations of the Episcopal Church and its attorneys who keep going in and arguing deference, 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 even though it's dead, should be dead with it's, neutral principles. It, you know, I, and I, I see some of the problems. One of the biggest problems I see is all the paperwork. Yeah. Okay, I got oh. to, to, to page yeah. 10 of this decision from Texas, and I, <laughs> I just didn't even worth my time. I, I'm going to go to live another day. <laughs> you didn't make it to page 41 where no. she complained about the record being 14,000 pages long. This is what their strategy is. You see, they, they take and they dump on the court all these ancient historical 
treatises and documents and old canons and old constitutions and they bury them in paper and say, look at us, look at our church, we've been going for 200 plus years, we're hierarchical, we're hierarchical. <laughs> so you're telling me Tech was quoting Levite law, oh perfect, good, 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 good. Yeah, Alan, right. I do want to thank you for your time today. Uh, you know, we, we put down a good uh, 16 minutes here and it's hard because uh, yeah. on paper we should have won this 20 years ago. Right. You know, all this millions of dollars we spent in courts uh, fighting for the property which the United States Constitution gives us open and clear according to neutral principles, um, it's right. difficult. Um, right. Now, and I understand Tech's desire to all of a sudden in, in the middle of nowhere become hierarchical. Oh, good for yeah. you. So. They found a horse they can ride and they're not knocked off it yet, so no. they keep riding it. Yeah. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Alan Haley. And this has been episode 314, is it? Of You're Tank. close. You know, it, with age, and I say this because I'm very <laughs> old now, uh, comes forgetfulness. It's 384. 384 of Anglican Unscripted that you've been watching, privileged and to see such, oh, cheery news. <laughs> <laughs> cheery professionals. <laughs> <laughs>